for those watching in the UK or a similar time zone, good afternoon. Uh, for those watching from elsewhere, a very warm welcome to you for wh whatever part of the day it is where you are. And no matter where you are in the world, a huge welcome to the 2022 SOCEMV Awards and Honorary Fellow Lecture, uh, very much a highlight in our calendars. My name is Phil Underwood. I'm the Engagement Manager here at the Society for the Environment. For those who aren't familiar, the Society's core role is to hold the Register for and Champion Chartered Environmentalists, Registered Environmental Practitioners and Registered Environmental Technician Registrants, who meet a very high standard of knowledge and professionalism across the world. Now, I wasn't scheduled to talk at all during this uh, very exciting event, but uh, we have had a, a last minute rejig of the roles because our, the chair of the society, uh, Will Pope, has, has come down with an illness today and has had, uh, has had to send his apologies. Um, but from the entire SOCEM family, we send our best wishes and hope that you get better very, very soon. For now, you're stuck with me and I'll do my best to channel some of Will's composure and enthusiasm where I can. But I'm hoping well, that, well, that won't change, um, but my uh, my one-year-old daughter storming in through the door may well change that very quickly, but I'll keep an eye on that situation. Um, in good news, I am joined by the Society's Vice Chair, Dougal Driver, and our Chief Executive, Emma Wilcox, to take us through uh, much of the proceedings. Shortly, we will be introducing uh, Professor Ian Barker to present this year's Honorary Fellows Lecture. Uh, we will then be chatting to the Society's newest honorary fellow, Dale Vince, um, before announcing the winners of the 2022 SOCEMV Awards. Before then, I'd like to take a few moments to talk, talk about World Environment Day. So as many of you are aware, the Society aligns their prestigious annual awards with World Environment Day every year, and for good reason. Alongside the awards, we strive to use World Environment Day as a, a powerful tool to shine a light on environmental challenges and opportunities. Uh, and achievement is very much part of this. Uh, we don't want World Environment, Environment Day to be all about doom and gloom. Um, there is fantastic work going on to protect and enhance the environment. And we want to shout about this by sharing stories of environmental professionals and recognizing outstanding achievement via the SOCEM Awards. World Environment Day was on Sunday, just gone, the 5th of June, but it seemed sensible on this occasion to delay the SOCEM Awards to allow people to return from their holidays and to recover from various Jubilee celebrations. The theme for from UN Environment uh, changes every year, but this year it focuses on only one Earth. So, to understand what this theme means to an environmental professional, we have a couple of special videos to show you from Chartered Environmentalists. On every Earth Day and World Environment Day, I always think of that image of our planet captured by the Apollo astronauts all those years ago. The first ever image we saw of what Earth looked like from so far away. Nothing brings home the truth about the theme only one Earth, as that image does. And while we have known this for a very long time, we have not been very good at taking care of our only home. For me, only one Earth not only means for environmentalists and conservationists to work together to ensure that we do not continue to destroy the only home we've ever known, but it also points to another level of col collaboration between professionals, politicians, bureaucrats, scientists, and even historians. In addition to my environmental research work, I also run a digital marketing agency. As a chartered environmentalist, I aim to ensure that the work my company does is sustainable and that there is more information about our collective digital footprint. Our company has signed the Sustainable Web Manifesto, which has also been signed by Google and others. For me, this is what only one Earth means, trying to save our home and working together to do so. Thank you. The theme of only one Earth is really important to me, and I see it as a rallying call. 
We live on this tiny planet that's one of billions in the universe, yet it has the perfect conditions for humanity to thrive. But we're causing species extinction on a massive scale. We're polluting the land, the air, the water, and we're using resources like there's no tomorrow. So my role as a chartered environmentalist is to provide leadership on these topics and really drive positive environmental change. It's about having a continual sense of learning and curiosity, um, understanding the needs of the planet as well as the needs of the organisation that we work for, and bringing new learning back into the business to deliver that positive change. And I think it's also important to bring a sense of optimism. Um, there's some very negative messaging around what we've done to the planet, but we have an innate sense of ingenuity as a human species. And if we come together, we can really solve these problems. So being a leader in these topics is really important because we only have one planet, so we all need to mobilise for that positive environmental change. Thank you for, to both Seema and uh, Sarah for sharing their insights, which are put much more eloquently than I would ever be able to do. So thank you for that. Uh, to find out more about our World Environment Day work, uh, please visit the website that is on your screen now. For the society, a key focus for ensuring the sustainability of um, our one Earth is collaboration, uh, which is an underlying theme for our honorary fellow lecture today. Uh, I'd like to therefore introduce Professor Ian Barker, who received his honorary fellowship last year. Uh, Ian is a chartered environmentalist registered with the Institute of Water. Uh, he's the managing director at Water Policy International and a board member at the Society for the Environment, amongst many other roles. Um, the intriguing title for Ian's talk is Dinosaurs, Droughts and Drains, a Water Story. Uh, and before I hand over to Ian, um, there will be time for questions following Ian's talk. So as a quick reminder to please use the Q&A function in your event toolbar, uh, which should be on your screen somewhere. Uh, Dougal will then continue once Ian has completed his talk. Uh, Ian, I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen for now, and it's over to you. Thank you, Phil. And I'm hoping everyone can, can see me. Um, I can see you, Phil, but can't see myself, but hopefully not too much of a problem for everyone. Um, I was delighted to have been asked by colleagues at Society of the Environment to give this lecture, only 15 or so minutes, uh, so, so I don't have very long. I couldn't really say no because I'm part of a Society of the Environment group which is looking at how we can get our honorary fellows to do more for the society. So really it was a question of, of having to say yes. Um, and then, of course, I had to think of a topic. And you might be intrigued around the title, um, Dinosaurs, Droughts and Drains. You might also be intrigued why I'm standing here holding this, this rock. Um, I haven't completely lost the plot, probably. Uh, but just thinking about the dinosaur element of the title first. Um, obviously, I couldn't have a dinosaur with me. But I've got perhaps the next best thing, which is a couple of dinosaur eggs. Now, these two little chaps um, never quite made it into the world, and they existed about five million years before the meteorite hit this planet. But dinosaurs tell us two really important things. Um, and I'll put that down because it's blooming heavy. Um, the first thing that dinosaurs tell us is that you're never too big or too successful to be wiped off the face of the Earth. And the second thing that they tell us um, and this must be true because it was in the Daily Mail a few years ago, um, is that all of us have drunk dinosaur pee. Um, and that is actually based on some sort of scientific fact, which is that all the water on our planet um, was created, was part of the planet at about the time that the planet itself formed four and a half billion years ago. So we have a finite amount of water, give or take a molecule or three. And you might think then, OK, so what's the problem? Because we all hear so much about the challenges of managing scarce water resources. Because we all know about the water cycle and the way that water goes round and round in that cycle of evaporation, precipitation, runoff back into the oceans and evaporation again. And it's not a problem until we start interfering with that cycle through the impact of climate change, greater uncertainty and extremes of weather, droughts and floods, or damaging that cycle through polluting it so that those 
waters available to us can no longer support either ecosystems or indeed humanity. So Sarah, if I could have the first slide, please. I work as an independent consultant um, in the UK and internationally advising governments and regulators and water companies and NGOs. Um, and one thing that struck me everywhere that I've worked in the, in the, on this world um, is pretty much every society values water. Um, and historically, and I'm confining this talk to the UK because a global one is just uh, impossible to do in the time available. And in the UK, for millennia, we have made votive offerings to special watery places. And on the left is an Iron Age uh, iron and gold hoard from Flinkelibach on Anglesey. And on the right is um, a holy well in a little village in southeast Wales called Trelec, not far from where I live. And you might think that that holy well, it's nice, it's quaint. It's a symbol, however, of a bygone, superstitious and less sophisticated age. And you might be right. But if you look at that picture carefully, you'll see that on the tree behind the strips of cloth hanging from people who visited that well and left a strip of cloth as a token to hope that their wish will come true. And also sometimes you'll visit and find flowers left in the niches there or coins thrown in. And if this was a live lecture, I'd be asking you to put your hands up to say, who has ever thrown a coin into a fountain or a wishing well just for luck? Now, we're supposed to be a rational um, society, scientifically based, so why do we do that? Um, and the next slide, Sarah, please, shows we still make votive offerings of special items into waterways. And the first picture, Sarah, shows some of the things that we care about that we give to our rivers, um, whether it's our favorite sofa or black bags full of special objects. But we also think that wildlife is important. And the next picture, Sarah, um, shows just how much we want to provide that wildlife with novel and interesting things to eat. Now, you know, these images are desperately sad if you care about water and ecosystems. Um, so you know, what do we really think about water if we're prepared to do this to the waters on this planet? And Sarah, the, the next start, slide will give us an understanding of what people think. The Consumer Council for Water, which is the body which looks after all of us in England and Wales as water consumers, does some fantastic research. And it did a great piece of deliberative research, trying to understand what people think, how do they value water? And the answer is they certainly do value water in the natural environment for their beauty and serenity and the positive emotions which being in a blue space evokes. And they value how water supports human health and well-being and its importance to ecosystems. And they're really concerned about sewage and plastic pollution, flooding and loss of biodiversity and droughts. So people really care, but we just don't really show it by the way that we treat those blue spaces. So the next slide, we'll have a look at one of those very special blue spaces a chalk stream. For many people, this is an iconic English river, um, sparkling, full of trout, um, full of biodiversity. And in England, we hold 80% or so of the global stock of this type of river. It's a unique ecosystem. There's a few in northern France and a couple in Denmark. But overwhelmingly, this rare and fragile habitat is a peculiarly English phenomenon. Um, that's what they should look like. The next picture, Sarah, shows what so many of them look like. I could show you one full of shopping trolleys, but I prefer instead to show you this image of a dried up chalk stream. And it's not dried up because of drought, although that does happen. It's dry because we're pumping too much water out of the chalk aquifer to feed our thirsty towns and cities in the south and east of England. And the next, next slide, shows that the problem, groundwater is pure, cheap, easily accessible. And since the Second World War, our abstraction from the chalk has increased hugely. So the map on the left shows the distribution of the chalk going from the Isle of Wight up through Hampshire, the Chilterns around London, and right up into the walls of Yorkshire, painted so well by David Hockney. Um, and on the right, 
is an image from WWF just looking at the state of those chalk streams. Reds and oranges mean that they're only in moderate or even worse, poor status. Um, good is in a greyish colour, which you can't see for two reasons. First of all, it blends into the background. And secondly, because only 5% of chalk streams are at good status. So you spend a long time looking for a chalk stream, which is in a good state. So the, the next slide, why is this happening? And I said it's because we're pumping too much water out of the chalk. People have been concerned about this for four decades, and, but we've been making glacial progress in terms of putting this right. And part of the problem is that despite the popular perception of England as being a very wet country, we're not. London has less rainfall than most Mediterranean cities, and East Anglia, under World Meteorological Office definitions, is considered to be semi-arid. So given that actual scarcity of water across much of England, you would think that we would use it carefully, wouldn't you? So if you look at the next slide, and just look at, this came from the excellent NGO WaterWise, with some top tips for saving water. And the reason we need to save water is that we are using it unsustainably and we need to use less of it. And again, if this was a live lecture, I'd ask you to put your hands up and say, do you know how much water you're using in your home as an individual? And WaterWise did some research that showed that just about 80% of the population think they are using less than 60 litres per person per day. The reality is that we're all using more than double that, between 140 and 150 litres per person per day on average. And to put that into a different sort of context, it means that each of us as an individual is using a tonne of water every week, delivered to our doors and into our homes, and then taken away again when we finish with it. In order to achieve water security in the face of climate change, more frequent and more extreme droughts, as well as population growth, we clearly need to be using less water and to put right the damage we've done to chalk streams and to other rivers. So the next slide will show some of the options that we're thinking about, which is essentially building our way out of a crisis. Now, in parallel to what this map shows, which is new reservoirs, new boreholes, new pumping stations, massive new transfers of water and effluent reuse, a large part of the assumptions about water security are that we will move from being using 140-ish litres per person per day to only about 110 litres per person per day. Now, at the rate we're going, there's not a cat in hell's chance of us doing that by 2050, which is the target date, because currently water use is increasing, not decreasing. And... This overall deficit that we're having to meet, which is about 4 billion litres a day, is partly because of increased demand, and it's partly to meet changes in environmental demand and put right some of the damage we saw on those chalk streams. So I'll just leave it to sort of ponder those thoughts, and then we'll move on to the next challenge, which is pollution. And just while Sarah's bringing the next slide up, um, I'll give you a little spoiler alert, which is every river in England fails on its chemical standards, and only one river in seven meets ecological standards. And on the left, you'll see what you've probably seen lots of images for over the last 18 months, unless you've been asleep, which is a sewage spill into a river. Um, and the Environmental Audit Committee reported in January this year, after a lengthy and in-depth investigation, the first independent and objective look at water quality in English rivers that I had the privilege of advising the committee on. Um, and it highlighted the fact that sewage spills are a massive issue. And the map on the right, taken from The Guardian, shows sewage spills in 2020. Um, something like uh, 400,000 spills totaling over 3 million hours. It was little better in 2021. Um, and you'll have seen many images for 2022, although the year is just beginning. 
And the challenge is that our sewage network is often in poor condition and it doesn't have the capacity to cope with housing growth or with the increased storminess that we see from climate change because most of our sewer network is a combined network that takes both rainfall runoff as well as foul, foul sewage. And one thing that came out of the EAC inquiry is when we heard evidence from citizen scientists, um, and they suggested that the monitoring and reporting by the water companies wasn't actually picking up on all of the spills and that some of those spills were in breach of the permits. And the Environment Agency in Offwat are now investigating what those citizen scientists told the committee and have hinted that there could be widespread permit breaches. So clearly there is a systemic issue with our ability to deal with sewage in a sustainable way that doesn't pollute the natural environment. Now, some of this is also responsibility for all of us as citizens because sewers spill when they're blocked, when people flush things they shouldn't flush down the toilet, like wet wipes, sanitary products, when they put fat sores and greases down the drains that block, block the sewers. So we all need to play a part as well. But let's move on to have a look at the next slide, which is it's not just sewage pollution we're concerned about, but in many places, many parts of the UK, agricultural pollution, agricultural runoff is a massive issue. Either runoff of soil during intensive rainfall, which takes everything that then is spread on the fields, whether it's fertilizer, slurry, and animal waste or pesticides. And on the right, you'll see a picture of the River Wye, that beautiful river that winds down through the Welsh English borders, which is a pea green color from eutrophication, from excessive fertilizers getting into the river, causing an algal bloom that just kills everything in the river. And again, citizen scientists are playing a key part in monitoring water quality and at, being active in terms of trying to get more join up between Wales and England and different policy approaches, between planners and farmers, and between land and water policies in the two nations, and to actually get something to happen in line with the legislation which exists. So let's move on and have another look at pollution. I and mean, every time, Sarah, when you go into uh, ATS or QuickFit to get your tyres changed, do you ever pause to think, what's happened to all the rubber on my tyres that's worn off? Um, when you get your brake pads or brake discs renewed, do you ever think about what's happened to all the material that's worn off? And the answer is, of course, it all drops down onto the highway. Some goes into the atmosphere, but that's another story. Um, and then when it rains, it washes off from the highway into a highway drain. And then it ends up in a river. So this, this cocktail of pollutants, a toxic mix of microplastics, metals and hydrocarbons, goes through the network of highway drains into our river system. And of course, everything that goes into a river ultimately ends up in the ocean. Now, the, the highways network, um, if you look just at the strategic road network operated by nat national highways, there's over 18,000 outfalls to rivers. Only 4,000 of those have any mitigation. National Highways has identified over 1,300 high-risk outfalls where there is a potential for um, severe environmental damage if they're not dealt with. Um, but the evidence they gave to the Environmental Audit Committee suggested it would take 55 years for them to mitigate the impact of those high-risk outfalls. So that's quite a sorry story, I'm afraid. Um, but if we go on to the next slide, only on Earth is the subject I was asked to talk about. You can extrapolate what I talked about for England pretty much to every country in the world. And yet in England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, we have some of the best legislation um, and some of the best regulation of any nation on the planet. And despite all that, we are damaging this fragile and precious resource, which is water, this finite resource. And we need to remember, um, and Simon, I think at the beginning, talked about you know, the blue dot that you see from space, that's Earth. 71% of our planet is, is water. Um, but fresh water 
is only two and a half percent of the total water on our planet. And two thirds of that, for the time being, is locked up in ice. And most of the remainder of that two and a half percent is in groundwater, much of which is becoming increasingly polluted or is unsustainably exploited, as we saw with the chalk. So we have a real challenge there in terms of dealing with what we're seeing for this tiny resource, which is death by a thousand cuts, which together results in freshwater ecosystems in peril and water security needing critical attention. WWF has reported that freshwater ecosystems, which are only 1% of the Earth's surface, have 10% of species in total. And in terms of vertebrate populations of mammals and amphibians and fish, a third of all species globally are at risk of extinction. One of the other organizations I work with is the OECD, who've reported that the global water crisis is as much a consequence of the failure of governance as it is of water scarcity. And one can argue that the reason for this chronic pollution is also a failure of governance. And professionals need to come together to, to deal with that. WWF have a great phrase, which I really like, called think like a river. And the problem is that too often professionals have operated within their technocratic bubbles rather than coming together to deal with complex and multifaceted problems. They just focused on one element. So as professionals across many disciplines, as we have on this call today, need to come together to create compelling evidence-based narratives to engage more widely beyond our technocratic bubbles and make a case for radical change to tell that water story and to strive to become good ancestors. Otherwise, our children won't thank us. And the final slide, Sarah, please. Just to give you some hope, a picture of a, a river as it should look. That's the River Wye upstream of the pollution. It will take more than simply throwing a coin and making a wish to restore our rivers to look like this. But that's a challenge for us as professionals to come together and to tackle these problems in a holistic and integrated way. Thank you. Back to you, Phil. Actually, I'm going to jump in here, Ian, if uh, you oh, do. Hi, Ian. Um, a brilliant lecture. If you can drop the slides off, please. Uh, thank you. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm Dougal Driver. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Society for the Environment. So um, thanks, Ian. You've, um, you've got some really, you've got some fans in the chat and you've got some great questions, but um, uh, you're being likened to, to old, uh, a professor, professors. I was going to say old lecturers, but I mean, that would have been really rude. So, you know, um, but it, it was a historic professor. So you might want to pick up on the chat later. Um, I just... I can't, I can't help reminding you and others that you used to work for the regulator. Um, for, in fact, I think perhaps for, the, for a big chunk of your career. And a lot of what you were pointing at suggests, as does one of the, the questions from Martin Biggs, who talks about, you know, where's the regulatory system here to kind of not put you in the position where that's the tenor of the lecture to us today. Um, is the regulator doing enough? Is it regulated enough at all? Is there one regulator? Is it confusing? Is it good enough? We have. Um, in the UK, the policies, the legislation um, and the regulatory, regulatory regime, which should be able to tackle all these issues. But the thing about regulators, and I say this as an ex-regulator, is um, if you want to watch dog to fight, you have to feed it. Um, and what we've seen um, in England and to an extent in Wales over the last decade is a protect, protect progressive reduction in the resources available for regulators to operate effectively in terms of um, compliance monitoring and then taking enforcement action to act as a, an ongoing deterrent. That's not to say they haven't because the Environment Agency, for example, has been successful in taking um, some very effective action against some water companies and occasionally farmers. But realistically, we need the resources, but we also need, um, and I'm sorry if this sounds political, but there's no other way of putting it, but we also need a government which is supportive of what regulators are there to do. And Sir James Bevan, the Chief Executive of the Environment Agency, is on record as saying that the government had asked it to, um, I'm paraphrasing, go gently on agricultural pollution. 
over the last few years. Um, and yet agricultural pollution is, rep is responsible for 40% of all water body failures. So as I say, regulators need the resources to be able to operate effectively. Um, and so a, a while ago, I, I ran a, um, a conference which had the theme of how can we make regulators redundant? Um, and uh, and senior representatives of all regulators of England, Scotland, and Wales were there to their credit. Um, and we make regulators redundant by those who um, use and would otherwise abuse the environment can be trusted not to do so. Um, and that's what we need to aim for, which is getting that level of understanding and commitment and cooperation in order to protect the fragile environment I was talking about. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's 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 not for me to challenge you on these things, but it seems rather ironic, doesn't it, that citizen science might drive the reporting of incidents and awareness, but there won't be, uh, but but there's instructions to to go gently. It's kind of that those things just don't come together very well, do they? If there's going to be more reporting, there's going to be more awareness and instructions to go easier. I guess I guess things aren't going to be solved. But I, it's, I'm not going to. I'm going to move on to another point, which is. Um, We've talked. We've talked for decades. If it almost feels like decades about carbon, um, I heard something the other day that water is going to be is the new carbon, or it will be. You know, water will be the thing we'll be talking about, needing to protect the quality and the quantity. And I, I think your 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 excellent first sort of slide sort of indicated towards that. Do you feel the same way that um, the carbon story will drift in, into the background behind water pretty soon? I hope the carbon story doesn't drift into the background, um, but I think that the, the water issue do needs to go further up in terms of in terms of profile. Um, you know, this is something that water professionals have been talking about for a long time. Um, but as you've probably got the idea, you know, we need a, water professionals need to come out of their out of our bubble, but, but also make a link to um, everybody else who's working on environmental issues. Um, I just so, as a sort of a, a, a simple illustration, just thinking about you know, the cost of living crisis and the price of energy crisis that we're facing at the moment. You know, a significant part of all our energy use in our homes comes from heating water to wash ourselves and wash dishes and wash clothes. Um, so um, better use of energy, more energy efficiency um, is really good in terms of water consumption as well and vice and vice versa. And we're not very good at just making that simple join up in terms of water and energy use within the home. And doing mm -hmm. that would help to go a long way as well, I think, towards reducing water use and improving water security. You get into a virtual circle then. Yeah. I think when you start to compartmentalize, everyone just focuses on one thing because it's easier. Um, if you join things up, you can get so many win-wins. Yeah. I, I suspect I'm going to bring this up shortly with, with Dale, actually. Um, but actually, that does reflect on something that I think probably Phil potentially put into the chat around joined up solutions, which we're not very we're not very good. But I'm going to finish on a on a, a more specific question, mixing together. Forgive me, uh, Carol Johnson and uh, Irene Williams. But Carol talks about who who records the spills, who records the, um, uh, you, you know, where, where is that where is that central repository and therefore action? I, I'm I'm reading between the lines there, Carol. Where can action therefore take place? And then Irene talks about Croyd Beach, something um, clearly close to her heart, where um, it's fine most of the year, but it, it, I don't think I've I think I've been there once, but I'm I'm pretty damn sure I could have guessed that during the tourism season the system will be put to stretch and 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 the pollution level is dramatically increased. So those two sort of things rather connect, and it's it's about you know spillages and what, why are these things not predicted and and who who records them, who reacts to them, and and how do we make a difference and change things? I'll be as brief as I can, but that's an enormous subject. It is. It's, um, it's a lot in so there. so very very briefly. Uh, Dougal. Um, in 2013, the then water minister, Richard Bennion, wrote to the chief executives of all water companies saying, I want you to install something called event duration monitors on all your sewer overflows. Um, nearly 10 years later, we're almost at the point where uh, sewer overflows have these so-called EDMs. And those are recording in real time when there is a spillage from a storm overflow. That information is then reported by the water companies, and it hasn't always been particularly accessible. So again, well, citizen science and more to the point NGOs like Surfers Against Sewage and the Rivers Trust have been collating this information 
and uh, servicing at sewage and rivers trust both have brilliant apps um, and warnings when a, a, a storm overflow is spilling so you can make an informed decision about whether or not you want to go swimming um, so the information is now transparent in the public domain, Surface Against Sewage and Rivers Trust. Go to those websites and, you, and you'll find it. Um, the water companies are committing to reduce the highest impact, highest risk spills, and that means at bathing waters. But even so, Surface Against Sewage have reported that effectively um, last summer we lost um, one in seven swimmable days. In other words, during the summer bathing season, one day in seven, it would be risky to go swimming because there's a sewer spill, meaning you're likely to get ill with the ear, nose and throat or gastroenteritis infections. Um, why, is this, why is this happening and what's being done about it? A key part of the problem, as I mentioned, is this combined sewer system that, that takes surface runoff, rainfall, as well as foul sewage. So one of the solutions clearly is to keep rainfall out of our sewers. And that can be achieved by sustainable drainage systems in villages, towns and cities, um, mopping up that rainfall and also creating green spaces in our towns and cities. Um, and that reduces the amount of inflow to the sewers or slow, and or slows it down significantly. We also need to ensure that new houses are new housing development is connected to sustainable drainage systems, and that's a requirement in Wales. The legislation came into place in 2010 in England, and the government there has yet to require it for new housing developments in a way that is the case in Wales. So keep surface water out of sewers, um, uh, and also ensure that sewers are able to cope with population growth, whether it's new houses, or also, as in the case of Croyd, where you get massive spikes in population, as with all tourist destinations at certain times of the year, they should have the capacity to cope with those peaks and not just, if you like, the normal baseline lower in the winter when fewer people are around. Ian, um, thank you so much. I, uh, I, I, I'd love to interview you over a much longer period. Phil, there's a challenge for you because um, Ian can't say no now because he's, he's, he's here on screen live, but I, I, I think there's a, there's a good 45 minutes or even longer with a coffee break chatting through picking that brain of yours because um, it's absolutely wonderful. And I think you've probably forgotten what the rest of us want to know about, about water and all those aspects you, you picked up. Ian, thank you so much indeed. You're very welcome and thanks for asking me. It gives me huge pleasure now to, to um, introduce uh, Dale Vince. Um, Dale has, has set up Ecotricity, a, a well-known renewable energy company um, set up in 1996. And, uh, and that was in my hometown of Stroud um, and is also looking to build a new stadia and other parts of infrastructure connected to it, which I'm, I hope we'll hear about in nearer to, to Stonehouse, which is where I went to school. So I've got, I've got sort of huge sort of historic connections with things but we only met for the first time yesterday in preparation for today. And I'm really looking forward to finding a bit more about someone who's um, the inventor of Sky Diamond and chairman of Forest Green Rovers, which I mentioned, but he's also a United Nations climate champion. Um, just announced uh, fairly recently the sale of Ecotricity, the, the renewable energy company. Um, and we're recognizing him uh, today. Dale, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off by, by linking a little bit to um, what, I, what I happily call NIMBYism, but uh, you started off with a, with one turbine. Renewable energy is clearly something that you know we, we need, but wherever I go, and I, I live in rural Gloucestershire now, and the solar farms around me are not particularly welcome. Um, can you just comment first uh, in your first reaction around NIMBYism and how that's affected you and developing your business? I would say um, <clears throat> NIMBYism is a media myth, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, when it comes to renewable energy, because all of the opinion polls ever undertaken since I've been doing this, which is like 25 years, have shown something like 60 to 70% of people support the idea of wind energy in their area and, and renewable energy more generally. Um, and about 10% of people are opposed, but it's the nature of our media that we hear about the people that are opposed. We don't hear about the people that think it's a good idea. Um, and, you know, you 
got to, it's worth asking yourself what in planning terms uh, doesn't have opponents, right? Uh, yeah. Roads, schools, um, waste incinerators. I mean, that's not, everybody should impose those. But, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> even if you want to put a shed in your garden, somebody's not going to be happy. It happens. So nimbyism has got in the way to answer another part of your question. It has made things more difficult, but it it, it didn't stop us. What stopped the uh, the wind and solar industry was five, ten years ago, um, somewhere between those numbers. David Cameron changed the planning system to effectively ban them, uh, ban onshore wind in in uh, England, in Britain, England, um, and solar. It just had its financial support removed, but it's back. Solar's back because it's become super cheap or cheap enough, and wind. Um, can be built without subsidy, but can't be built under the current planning regime. And he did that because 100 of his own MPs wrote him a letter to say um, wind was really unpopular in their constituents, uh, the constituencies, and would he do something about it? You know, and it, it was it was politics really uh, that yeah. uh, that killed onshore wind, and it is a real shame because it needs no public money. Uh, we can have a massive program of onshore wind building. Uh, windmills are popular things, particularly. They're appreciated for the job they do in terms of clean energy, but right now, of course, it's uh, energy independence. Um, and we can get the price of energy down in our country if we were to do that. We need to put no public money into an onshore wind or solar program, um, but the government have turned the backs on it. So uh, what would be the, if, if you feel there's a barrier in policy today, you know, looking forward to 2022 um, from when you were battling those and what Cameron did in the past, you know, what would be the big barrier today? Or do you feel that there's, there's a good policy landscape to enable to expand the renewables to the level that, that we need? Well, it's all about policy. Um, policy in our country in planning terms, uh, in tax and subsidy terms, is skewed entirely to the old bad way of doing things, burning of fossil fuels, uh, industrial animal farming. They're the two big culprits. Um, our whole system is geared to support those bad industries and to hold up the, the good industries. So, for example, there's a presumption in planning law in favor of fossil fuel power stations, and there's a presumption against onshore wind. I, I, I find that almost impossible to... To comprehend. I mean, I'm going to challenge you. Is that that? That's. I, I yeah. I just kind of. I don't even know what to. I because I believe yeah. you because it's you staggering. know this stuff. It, yeah. it, I can't even. I don't even know how to come back on you on that without it's, saying it's you've, got it, you've got it wrong, Dale. <laughs> <laughs> Let me offer you another one. Then I'll double down. Right? There's a carbon tax. There's a carbon tax on green energy that makes no carbon. But if you're a big industrial user of fossil fuels, you're exempt from the same carbon tax. OK, um, we, we need to definitely know more about this. Um, I'm, I feel terrible that I, I didn't know some of those things because they, 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 they are the barriers that turned into be a bit more, bit more of a scarier question than I thought. But, you know, generally, are you, are you, do you feel it's a positive trend in the direction of travel here? Do you feel that looking at manifestos for people who want to get elected, manifestos for certain people who want to try and stay in power maybe but not uh, not emin not not talking much about the environment but do you feel that there's um a race to the top now in terms of a race to the race to the top in terms of um green solutions in particularly in your area of renewables you know what i think is happening is a, a little bit like um the professor said the last speaker um we've got all the right policies we've got zero carbon enshrined in law in our country you know, uh, we have a government that says all the right things um, and aims for all the right things and then does all the wrong things, right? The same government that put this uh, zero carbon target into law wants to reopen coal mining in Cumbria and in Wales. They want to spend 26 billion on a road program uh, to expand the capacity of our roads when it's proven that all that does is increase traffic. They want a third runway at Heathrow when we know that aviation is a problem sector. They're pouring billions into the North Sea right now to get more oil and gas out mm. when we know that the North Sea is running out anyway. You know, it's maybe got 10 years left, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. And um, this is the same government that changed planning law, property law and environment regulations uh, to make fracking easier, to try to force fracking on, on a very unwilling uh, country. So if you, if you look back to opinion polls, you see the mirror image of the support for wind energy is the opposition to fracking, about 70%. But this government, uh, this party in government, didn't care. 
They put in place what they called the most generous tax regime in the world. They changed property law, environment regs, and they took planning out of the hands of local people, and they put it in the hands of county councils. They still didn't work. We still don't have fracking, but they've toyed with the idea of bringing it back. And if fracking was running now at full tilt, it would last for eight years, right? It'd be gone by 2030. What's the point of kicking this can down the road? We know that we have to stop using fossil fuels. Uh, we might as well do it now and have the benefits of that sooner. Right, audience, hold on to your seats because this is only going to warm up. So I want to ask, uh, do you feel that our, given your, your observations there, let's call them those, do you feel that, you know, where are we in the league table? You're a United Nations, you're, so you're a global, global champion. You obviously, therefore, have a view perhaps on how we're performing in the global league table of such things. Where would you put us and, and why, are, why are we where we are in that league table? Um, I don't know which kind of league table you might be referring to. Like, I mean, there are lots of different versions, probably like the amount of installed renewable uh, capacity, perhaps the growth rate of renewable capacity. There are all kinds of measures. But my my favorite measure would be to, to just to look at what we're capable of, look at the resources we've got as a country and yeah. the extent to which we're using them. And I would say we're pants, right? We're the bottom of a league table because we've got... We've got enough renewable energy to power the country 20 times over. That's just the wind and the sun. We haven't begun to tap tidal or wave yet, and they are expensive technologies, and, and that's the reason why they're relatively rare. Geothermal is uh, is appearing in Cornwall, which is an amazing opportunity for us for uh, on-demand, uh, constantly on-demand uh, renewable energy, 24-7 baseload is what they talk about in the industry for fossil mm -hmm. power stations. Um and and then you know we've got all of the other opportunities with the smart grid, battery storage, green gas, which we launched last week. A new report that shows that um, we don't need to throw away the national gas grid. We don't need to scrap tens of millions of boilers and cookers. We don't need to impose a cost of eight thousand pounds on every household to buy an air source heat pump that will increase household energy bills by fifty percent every year. We don't need to do any of those things. We can just change the gas in the gas grid. Yeah. We have enough grassland to make enough gas to power our whole country. It's like our new North Sea. We can be independent for gas, but made from a renewable resource. So, yeah. you know, on those measures, I think we're, we're just rubbish. Yeah. Um, and and, and we, we need a government that actually gets this. It doesn't just say the right things, does the right things. So at the moment, our, our government sees these as boxes to tick, say, that, say the right thing on this policy and, and then move on. I mean, Boris Johnson famously went to COP26, didn't he? He berated world leaders for the gap between words and deeds and said it wasn't good enough uh, for your words not to match up to your deeds. Then he jumped on a private plane to fly back to London for a private dinner. I mean, come on. Well, what's that for leadership? And, and how hypocritical is that? But that's Boris Johnson, OK? But he does lead the government. He does lead the government. And that's our problem because we had, we had 10 years, according to the UN, to avoid the worst uh, of, of the climate crisis to keep within one and a half degrees. And we're about four years into that 10 year period now. And, you know, we've wasted it under this government. So it's really vital that we get a much better government at the next election, which is going to be coming soon. Well, you, you segued there into something I'll pick up in a minute. I'm just going to go to some questions. You segued with green gas into something that um, I wanted to ask you about, which is land use, which is close to, to my heart, different ways of using our precious land, if it is so precious. And also, therefore, I'm going to just jump into some specifics. Let me just bring up that Q&A so I've got names. Actually, I remember the questions, but um, Becky, uh, Becky's talking about the MOD and radar, you know, uh, wind interfering with radar. That's a question. And the second one is, um, actually, I've got a third one coming, but what about local engagement and en en energy supply? Um, actually, I might answer the third one which is does ecotricity have any plans to grow beyond the uk a uh, bizarre that i should answer this to the founder and the ceo but if, if you're selling ecotricity one assumes that might be up to the buyer but um you might want to comment on it on on beyond the uk but let's let's focus on is radar in, in affected in your opinion and local engagement in energy supply i guess we're thinking district heating systems community systems those sorts of things maybe something else you you will know about yeah okay well look uh I've always thought that the um, the radar thing, so I was distracted by a duck, the radar thing in wind energy is like, um, I don't know. It's it's like, are we serious that, that we, we have this high-tech military and they can't deal with a few windmills? They can't tune that out of their radar, actually. Because if we are serious, it means that we 
we've given our enemies around the world the perfect solution to keeping us out of their country, right? Just build some... Walk windmills. around with windmills in their hands. Yeah. <laughs> it makes no sense to me. I think the MOD is just very slow and very conservative. And, and you see in other parts of the world, it's not an issue, but it's been an issue here. Um, local engagement, uh, I guess it comes in various different forms. Uh, you know, uh, district heat schemes, I think, are a good idea, but there are very limited uh i think opportunities to do that uh, with new build you have you have the perfect opportunity but retrofit i think is always going to be very expensive and difficult um the tories used to talk about uh some kind of community uh funding from renewable energy schemes um you know in order to like buy people's acceptance of new things uh, and then other people work on community ownership where the idea is that a local community can buy shares in uh, renewable energy and benefit from that and there's been a lot of kind of, uh, I would say, excitement about that kind of model, like it's the perfect answer. I don't think that it is because it's only available to people that have the money to buy shares. So it's exclusive, it's not inclusive. Um, what we've done instead is we've come up with a, with a model. We, we took our home county of Gloucestershire and we did a GIS-based survey of the county. And we looked to see how many windmills it would take to power all of the homes of the county. There's about 600,000 people. Um, and we found it was just 100 and we would have to take just 3% of the hilltop land in the whole county of Gloucestershire to power all the homes with uh, renewable energy, which, which is nice. But that's only half the story. Second half of the story is we proposed that it would be owned by the local authorities themselves and that the money, the revenue, therefore, from those 100 windmills would flow directly into local services and would therefore benefit everybody. The perfect model of community ownership would be that everybody benefits. Um, we called it 100 mils for Gloucestershire because that's exactly what it was. It was a Ron Seal name, and uh, we, you know, we're still hoping to land it. Yeah, um, I know. We're, I know I'm going to get shouted out for running out of time, but I'm literally going to keep going till I get shut off. No, I'm only joking, uh, Phil and Emma. And um, so, just to to let you know, anonymous attendee, I'm afraid I'm not going to put your question to, to Dale because I don't know who who you are. If you're able to change your your tag. Uh, 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 and we have time. I will. I will put your question to Dale. Um, but this one links into the, that land use subject that we talked about yesterday. This this question from Russell Thomas: um, Does Dale support the transition from methane to hydrogen and biomethane, or does he believe the future is purely biomethane? And and you, you're welcome to drift into that whole we haven't got enough land thing, Dale, that we talked about. <laughs> I definitely want to talk about land, uh, yeah. but I just want to say that hydrogen gets a lot of hype. And I don't think it's got the role to play that many people think it has. The big oil companies are behind it because it suits their infrastructure, <laughs> refineries, tankers, and, and forecourts. Uh, but it, in a vehicle application, uh, it takes twice as much energy to do a mile in, in a hydrogen car as it does an electric battery car. And so it can't make sense to uh, be so energy inefficient um, and, and use hydrogen to do that when we've got the answer with battery cars and, and renewable energy. I think there'll be limited uh, scope for hydrogen in uh, in various different sectors, but my favorite is in the gas grid, where uh, the, the gas grid itself and the appliances, all new appliances since something like 1996, have been able to take 20% hydrogen. So when we scoped out what it would take to replace fossil gas and, and what the future looks like 100% renewable, we left that space in there for 20% hydrogen because in order to minimize the times of having not enough electricity from the wind and the sun. We need to oversize the fleet. And when we do that, we'll create times when we have too much. We can turn that into hydrogen. We can put it into the gas grid. We can store it. We could turn it into electricity if we needed it more than we needed gas. But we've got a, a fuel in the middle with hydrogen, a way of storing excess renewable energy. So I'm a big fan of 20% hydrogen maximum uh, in the gas grid. Land use, can I pivot to that? You can, go for it. <laughs> All right then. So I watched the uh, I watched the lecture with great interest actually, and I wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, one is food choice is a big driver of water shortage and river pollution. Right, I think it's something like four thousand liters of water to make a quarter pound beef burger. Right, we have to change our food choice in order to get to net zero. Anyway, um, we raise and kill a billion animals a year just in Britain, a billion, which is obscene. Uh, most of them, like 85% uh, live in sheds. They never see outdoors. We have to feed them B12 because they can't get it from um, their environment. So something like 97% of all B12 supplements that we make, we feed to animals so that when we eat the animals, we get some B12. 
which is madness. And this is a kind of uh, <laughs> just a good example of how mad this our diet has become in the last 50 years. If we all went plant based, we would free up 75 percent of farmland. We could give it back to nature. We could stop putting chemicals on it because we use that land at the moment to grow crops, to feed animals, to feed people. And we get the most incredible diminishing returns in terms of uh, nutritional value. With a cow, it's the worst, 10 in for one out. Uh, fish are probably the best. Chicken, uh, probably second best. Uh, but all of it's bad. It's all a diminishing return and it can't make sense. It's so inefficient. And on top of that, because we're poisoning ourselves because uh, animal diets are... Um, <laughs> the big drivers of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, that, those chronic illnesses that affect us in later life, they're not, they're not curable, they're chronic, you just live with them. They affect quality of life as well as shortening life. Um, so we're killing ourselves, we're killing the planet through climate emissions, and we're killing a billion animals a year, and we're polluting our rivers because the runoff is from industrial farming. It's a, it's a crazy place that we're at, but it's all solvable. Uh, if we go plant-based uh, and we power ourselves completely with renewable energy, we've got to give up two things, fossil fuels, and uh, industrial animal farming. We do those two things. So many of our problems are unwind themselves. Uh, I'm off now, but off the soapbox. This is this is one of the most difficult interviews I've ever done to try and get anything passionate out of uh, anybody. Um, okay, that's a joke, by the way. You don't know me well enough. Yet, <laughs> um, so, what what I need from the audience here is not to go quiet on me because or on Dale, just because Dale it really knows his stuff and is really passionate and very clear doesn't mean it can't be challenged so I want to see some challenge back on that summary and that is a summary from Dale there's loads of strands to every bit he's mentioned I'm going to pick up on one of those strands myself nobody who knows me would be at all surprised to know that I would like to get a much higher percentage of the United Kingdom under the cover of well not under cover a mixed woodland has got a load a lot of open space a lot of water a lot of different habitats and biodiversity but also more trees and um, I am constantly uh, stopped, if you like, with my collaborations from doing this because there ain't enough land to go around. So a sort of specific here is that if we do these things, if we've got enough land for for everything, because you won't be able to stop people wanting to eat meat. And I hear from the agricultural lobby occasionally that food security is a massively important thing. Yeah, so um, a couple of things there. The uh, consumption of red meat is on the decline in our country, 30% over the last 10 years. Climate Change Committee of the government have said we need to, another reduction of between 30 and 50% to get to net zero. It's an absolute fact that we must eat less animals. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, sorry, I lost my thread there. So, uh, is there enough you, land? You I mean, said yesterday about seventy-five percent being freed up yes. from not doing. Yeah, yeah. That. that seems extraordinary. Yeah, and, it does, and this is not from me. This is from Oxford Uni that published a study. I think it's three years ago now, just before the pandemic. And the big picture stat that I missed is that seventy-five percent of our country is farmland, and seventy-five percent of that is not needed if we eat plants, which equates to roughly half of our entire country in terms of land area. So we certainly free up which we can give back to nature on a vast scale and, <clears throat> and unwind or reverse these uh, these great uh, depletions that we have in our own country. You know, we've lost our own actual uh, rainforest. Britain was home to a temperate rainforest. There are very few pockets left. So there's a literal and metaphorical loss of rainforest in our country. We can reverse all of that. When it comes to renewable energy, we did some number crunching recently because I saw a story in Germany um, the ruling party has said, look, we just need 1% of Germany to get to 100% green electricity. We crunched the numbers from Britain. It's the same answer, 1%. So okay. we can free up 50%, and we only need one of those to get to 100% green electricity. When we looked at the, um, our, our gas story, the report we put out last week said that we could power all of Britain's homes with grass from gas without touching land in agricultural use. Hey, um, I'm gonna, I'm, I, you've paused, and I don't want to stop, but I'm literally getting so many personal messages from the team saying, you know, time's run out. Shut him up. Shut him up. <laughs> not, not you, no, shut me up. I'm thinking, they definitely want to hear more from you. Um, I, but I, I've got to ask this very, if you can summarize um, why you're selling Ecotricity, which I thought was quite a, a straightforward, sensible question, because there's a lot of love in the room for what you've done. And I suspect that okay. behind that question is um, keep going, but yeah, just, just briefly. And then Emma, I'll, I'll hand over to you in two seconds. Briefly as I can then. I, a couple of different strands of thought. The biggest one probably was that 
renewable energy had become mainstream. It's a global mainstream industry. Every government of the world has it at the heart of its zero carbon targets. When I started 25 years ago, it was a very novel concept. I figure the most impact I've been able to have in the green energy sector has been had, actually, other than the green gas plan. And what I'm looking for is some new frontiers where I can make more of a difference. At the same time, we have a pipeline of 2,000 megawatts of projects that needs building, that needs funding, about three billion pounds. So we need uh, <clears throat> a new owner with the big, big enough pockets to take forward our pipeline of projects, because that's the scale we need to be building out in our country. So I think Ecotricity can do more now without me. And I learned this lesson when we sold our electric highway last summer. We had struggled to keep pace with the demand for new pumps and stuff, found a great owner with deep pockets, and uh, and we passed it on. First time I ever had sold a business, I uh, never thought that I would, uh, but I learned from that. And I think now that with Ecotricity, it's time to let it go. And, and through that, I can achieve more. Value-driven stuff. Thank you, Dale. I, I'm, we've not answered all the questions. I hope you understand why we haven't answered all those questions, although I th- I, you know, uh, you've inspired a lot of people, I can tell from the chat. Um, Dale, again, as with Ian, Professor Ian, it would be great to do a sort of longer version of this or even focus on something. Thanks for your time. We need to move and, and welcome as an honorary fellow to, to the cadre that the society has. You, you are extremely welcome and um, qualified. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being here and chatting to you, I have to say. <laughs> okay, we'll, do, we'll, we'll definitely do some more then, because that was recorded, so you can't you can't uh, hide away from me. And I know where you... Well, I, I do know where you live, actually. That is true. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks, Dale. Emma, over to you for a really even more joyous part of, of today's event. Thanks, Dougal. Um, thank you to Ian for that uh, really interesting lecture. Um, a real honour to kind of listen to Ian speak. And Dale... Fantastic. Congratulations um, and look forward to hearing lots more from you. And what a brilliant um, backdrop to where you're sat. I'm not quite sure where you are, but it looks incredible. Uh, So thank you. So I get the really amazing job um, this year of telling you who our award winners are. So obviously I got the the long straw, I think, for this year. So um, we've got two award winners that we're going to announce. And Dougal and I are going to do a little bit of a, a tag team. Dougal chairs the judging panel, um, so I will read through the finalists and tell you who's won, and then Dougal will be having a quick chat with um, each of our winners, uh, so stay around for that. Um, first of all, and I know people always say this in judging panels, but it really was difficult. The, the standard of entries is incredible, and the things that people are doing are just uh, so inspirational, so thank you to everybody who entered. Um, you really did make the judges' job very, very hard. Um, So I'm going to start, first of all, with our Registrant Newcomer of the Year. Um, So this is someone who's joined one of our registers in the last 12 months. Um, So this is people who've kind of got that professional registration and then really hit the ground running um, on what they're doing. And some really fabulous work uh, coming through from these people. (laughs) Excuse me. So first of all, the finalists in alphabetical order are Abigail Dombey, CM energy and sustainability engineer at Net Zero Associates and registered via the Energy Institute. Abigail is also a chartered engineer and a member of many institutes and networks, including SIBSI, Sussex Innovation Forum and the Energy Manager Association, just to name a few. Although she has 20 years experience in the field, since 2021, Abigail has been has taken her impact to the next level, including becoming chair of Hydrogen Sussex, supporting facilitating the low carbon hydrogen economy across the county. Her expertise and dedication was reflected in her gaining chartered environmentalist status via the Energy Institute late last year. And we are very pleased to have you on the register, Abigail. Uh, Congratulations for that as well. Uh, Next, we have Paul Field, CM. Environmental and Compliance Manager at Janus International Europe Limited and registered via Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment or IEMA. Paul's journey to becoming Chartered Environmentalist with IEMA has seen him go from working in fossil fuel extraction, first as a coal miner and then with the, the automobile sector to fully embrace the opportunity for career transition into green jobs by studying for an environmental sciences diploma with the Open University. I think anybody who's done uh, distance learning programs knows how dedicated you need to be for that. So fabulous. In the last 12 months, Paul has truly excelled 
guiding Janus towards its goal to be net zero by 2040, implementing environmental management systems and developing a sustainability roadmap. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have Carol Johnson, CM, Agricultural Consultant at Hexham and Northern Rural, registered via the Institute of Agricultural Management or IAGRAM. So Carol's achievements demonstrating her expertise and dedication as well as leadership and communication skills make her a very worthy finalist for this award. Having grown up on the family farm, she's worked as an agricultural consultant for many years and is hugely passionate about sustainable farming. farming. Her current role at Northern Rural sees her work throughout the northeast of England and Cumbria, advising clients on sustainability matters, including environmental stewardship. Okay, so on to the winner. The judging panel commended this finalist for their determination, broad experience and strong commitment to learning and upholding of professional standards. They also remarked on the finalist full circle journey from working in fossil fuel extraction, firstly as a coal miner, and then within the automobile sector to becoming chartered environmentalist and selling in his, excelling in his role as environmental and compliance manager. Particularly standout was the clear impact of their work since the start of 2021, guiding their employer towards the goal to be net zero by 2040. As a result of these achievements and more, they are without a deserving winner of the 2022 Registrant Newcomer of the Year. So I'm absolutely delighted to announce the 2022 Registrant Newcomer of the Year is Paul Field, CM. Congratulations, Paul. Absolutely unbelievable. I can't believe it. Um, this is the first time I've ever won anything, and I feel it's quite humbled. Um, it's through the support of some fantastic colleagues and friends that I've reached this point in my career. Um, and I can't think of any words, really. Oh, well done, Paul. <laughs> And I'm supposed to answer, ask a question now. And uh, um, so, um, well, that's a fantastic reaction. I think it 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 reinforces some of the aspects of um, what the the judging panel that I'm so fortunate to to, to chair um, felt about your application. <clears throat> really strong applications around you, by the way. Do, do not do not forget that as you go away and celebrate later. Um, but. Um, Tell me, tell me how it feels um, doing the sort of work you do now as opposed to the work you did in the past. Because um, I'm fortunate to have, have started in the woods digging ditches and, and, and now I managed, well, is it more fortunate to sit behind a desk? How does it feel now coming into work? But um, do you feel like you're having more of an impact maybe? Well, I hope so. And I believe that the company I work for and the colleagues I work with, uh, I've got every opportunity with what's left of my career to try and make a difference. Uh, from being a young coal miner, I could never envisage this occasion. Um, well, your career is not going to end very quickly. I can assure you of that. Uh, I think you, you can. You, 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 it sort of starts now, and, and and as your as your fame will grow as well, and and your knowledge and people, you know, uh, it's 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 not about giving back. It's just about sharing and working together, isn't it? Just give me a sense of some of the things that are on you, in, on you, in your in tray at the moment today, this week. So we, we, uh, we're a small company, but we've got a big footprint. So we have customers in Europe, uh, Dubai, uh, Scandinavia, and all over the UK. So once we can impact scope one and two emissions that we have for the business, we're looking at uh, impacting on the scope three emissions for business travel. And we've uh, researched and found some innovative solutions where there's a um, carbon capture uh, project in Iceland called Orca, where they extract the ambient air the filter behind the fans dissolves the carbon into water that's pumped down into basalt rock and it turns permanently into stone. <clears throat> and if you've seen a black pudding and seen the white bits in the black pudding, the core samples are exactly that, the white parts, the carbon that's permanently fixed in the ground. And that's a potential, it's run that scale now, so that's probably a short-term solution, while the mid-term solutions for what the government's planned is an East Coast cluster where pipelines from Tees Port and Humberside would pump carbon into all oil wells. At the same time, they're on those sites that have um, um, renewable energy sources and hydrogen producing facilities. And then finally, everyone wants to plant trees, but trees take a while to grow. 
So potentially, um, look at seagrass. Seagrass extracts 35% more carbon from the air than tropical rainforests. And we have it all around our island. We just need to look at ways of how we can uh, try and utilise that natural solution as well. Oh, brilliant! I, I, another person I want to talk more to. Um, just we're, we're going to we're going to stop there because we've we've got another award to get to, and I'm already in trouble. Um, the, the passion you've you've shown, the 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 value you place on the work you do, is impossible to get across in an application, as I'm sure uh, the other applicants may may well know as well. Um, so um, you've got all of those things as well, which is just dub- doubly rewarding. Um, to see. And just to let you know, if you're, you're probably not concentrating on the chat function at the moment, but your colleagues are congratulating you from across Europe, as are your, your fellow contestants in this competition. So um, you should rightfully be very, very proud. Well done. Mm. <laughs> wow, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> That's it. Emma. Wonderful. Uh, Thank you. So things you'll learn if you don't know us very well as the society and those of you do know two things. Number one, we are really nosy. So we'd love to know about what you're doing. And number two, we'd love to tell your story as well. So Paul, we will be um, a real pain, I'm sure. Um, just really wanting to tell your story and about the work you're doing. So hopefully that's OK. But massive congratulations. And, and as I said, um, anyone who's done those uh, distance learning programs knows how difficult they are in the dedication. So uh, massive congratulations to you and the other finalists as well. OK, so we have one more award to talk about. Um, the Environmental Professional of the Year for 2022. So some of our previous winners are David Simmons, Mandy Zeranati, Jerome Badley, David Stubbs, Dan Redding. You can go onto our website and read about all of their wonderful stories and the, the amazing work that they all do. Um, but now we're going to talk about this year. So we have um, three finalists to tell you about. So first of all, uh, Stephanie McGibbon, CM, Director at Arup and registered via IEMA. Stephanie joined, uh, jointly leads Arup Environmental Arm in London and works tirelessly to ensure sustainable development. Among her many achievements since joining Arup in 2000 are leading the London Impact Assessment Team and diversifying their work to include health and equalities as key elements of social sustainability. Committing Arup to the Diverse Sustainability Initiative recognising the environmental profession's poor record on diversity and the action needs to be taken to achieve change and leading Arab to achieve and maintaining a quality mark in environmental impact assessment. She has shown dedication to making a difference beyond her role at Arab, taking up positions, including visiting lecturer to MSc students at the University of London and as a trustee of the Environmental Law Foundation. Throughout her career, she has shown a dedication to the uploading of professional standards, a chartered environmentalist since 2008. She is also a fellow of IEMA, uh, a member of both the Royal Town Planning Institute and the Royal Holloway School of Life Sciences and the Environment Agency Board. Uh, Next, we have Professor Russell Thomas, CM, Technical Director at WSP and registered via the Institution of Environmental Sciences, or IES. At WSP, Russell was in charge of research and development within the ground and water team. His work and application of his knowledge has a clear impact in driving understanding, good practice and innovation, particularly in the field of contaminated land. He's been at the forefront of the development of sequential reactive barrier groundwater treatment systems and is a member of the Network for Industrially Coordinated Sustainable Land Management in Europe uh, Innovation, Innovation Working Group and has authored a number of influential reports and publications. With his position of visiting professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Strathclyde, Russell manages research projects and collaborations between the university and WSP, as well as project supervision, lecturing, and presenting at conferences. As well as being a chartered environmentalist, Russell holds several other recognitions which demonstrate his expertise and commitment to CPD, including being a fellow of the Institution of Gas Engineers and Managers and a chartered fellow of the Royal Society of Biology. And again, last but no means least, Becky Toll, CM, Managing Director at Crowbury Consulting Limited, registered via IEMA. 
Becky's achievements reflect her clear knowledge and leadership, excellent communication skills, and an infectious passion for protecting the environment. She has over 20 years experience as an environmental professional. Setting up and leading her own business, the award-winning Crowberry Consulting and Engineering um, and Energy since 2006. In this time, she has supported swathes of UK and EU-based businesses to become more sustainable by implementing ISO environmental management standards, delivering, delivering innovative training courses, and giving back by coaching and mentoring early career professionals. A career highlight was achieved in 2021 as Becky was appointed in partnership with Arup as lead sustainability consultant of both G7 and COP26, with her work duly recognized as the events were awarded the ISO um, 202121 standard. So, um, as I said with the judges, a really, really difficult uh, decision with this category as well. Uh, you really, all of you really, really challenged the judging panel this year, but we have to have a winner. The judging panel noted the winner's clear knowledge and leadership, excellent communication skills and infectious passion for protecting the environment. In setting up and leading their own business, they have supported businesses across Europe to become more sustainable by implementing ISO environmental management systems, deliver, delivering training courses and giving back to a profession that has given her so much by coaching and mentoring early career professionals. Judges notes that they have gone truly above and beyond to protect the environment and a worthy winner of the 2022 Environmental Professional of the Year Award. So I'm delighted to announce that this year's winner is Becky Toll, Managing Director at Crowbury Consulting Limited. Congratulations, Becky. That's crazy. <laughs> I just thought I was here to make up the numbers. Um, thank you so much. That's absolutely such an honour. Um, and could, I'm literally got tears in my eyes. I was not expecting that. Um, thank you to the judges. Thank you to all the finalists as well. Um, it's a real pleasure. It's a real honour. And we all work tirelessly day in, day out uh, to protect the environment. And I know that everyone in this sector is genuinely flat out right now, uh, working so hard. <laughs> My team's clapping in the background. So I think they're going to come over. Come, come on over, guys. Uh, <laughs> genuinely, um, I wasn't, wasn't expecting that, but Thank you. Thank you. So it is genuinely a real honour. Thank you, Dougal. Thank you, Emma. It's it's mm. really great. Well, um, <laughs> there, there, there's there's no need to thank us. Um, the, your, your, oh. your competitors do put us through some, some pain. It was, um, it, it, it was a, a, as always, a hard decision-making process. So you should remember that when you reflect and you have a time to yourself that um, yeah. you, 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 you were up against some, some strong competition oh. and you totally deserved to win. You absolutely nailed it. Oh, so, my sister's welcome. just said thank you on the chat. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> oh, that's really um, sweet. So... Okay, I'll try and I'll try and get some a sensible Q and A going a little bit here, which might not be that easy. You do <laughs> you 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 do join an, an illustrious group, and there will be illustrious people after you. But it does a little bit like Paul before you. I always I mean, you know, what's in your interest today, this week that you know you just said how hard you're working, but just give us a little flavour about what that work looks like to to do some. Oh good stuff. gosh. Gosh, I'm, I'm not allowed to name names, but we're the whole team. Don't, don't the whole <laughs> team is working flat out at the moment on a very large sports event that's going to be televised over the summer uh, on sustainability, sustainability management plans for that. Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. We're doing a lot on carbon management, past 2060, carbon footprinting for lots of different clients um, based up and down the country because everyone's got to get to net zero. Um, what else are we doing? Gosh, we're doing a lot of legal registers, a lot of compliance stuff uh, for clients who are keen to not break the law, frankly, um, and <laughs> stay stay within the bounds of compliance. Um, well, look, let me let me let yeah. me interrupt you because it was an unfair question, but I, you did very well in answering. It. Just <laughs> we we may have a minute if I'm not turned off or told off uh, to, <laughs> for people to put questions to you in the Q and A. So please. Guys, yeah. there, do, put, do put questions in and then it's not my fault that I'm answering them. But the thing <laughs> is, let me ask a bit about I really like the two examples you gave there because it's it's, it's there was the I, I must do the minimum. There's the compliance side. And then there's yeah. I'd like to actually stretch yeah. myself, you know, in terms of those clients coming into you, do you get a sense that there are more clients wanting to do more than than they are asked to do and that it is part of their, their baseline values these days? 
Yeah, absolutely. If you go back 20 years when we were talking about issues like biodiversity, um, you know, circular economy, waste management, mm -hmm. social impact, I might as well have been talking Russian. Now I go into businesses and talk about these issues and they get it and they actually understand um, that these are super important, not just to investors, but to their staff, uh, to the local community. So mm -hmm. now I'm not talking Russian. In fact, we're on the same page and yeah. they just need that help, um, Dougal. So it's very much, you know, the laggards, if you like, and the blockers and the barriers who I've you know, smashed out the park for the last 20 years, frankly, they're getting less and less and less. Mm -hmm. um, now we're seeing a lot more engagement and it is driven, I do believe, through the ESG, the social responsible investment, obviously the millennial generation as well. I don't know if my son's watching today, but you know he's heard me banging on about environmental management for the last 22 years. So um, he, he might be uh, listening to this right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we've noticed a massive change and obviously it's COP26 leverage like no before. When we go into businesses now, they get it. They understand, you know, 1.5 degrees is absolutely critical. Um, and they also understand that the legislation is, is driving this. But they simply understand they need to do it because it's the right thing to do. So, you know. Really interesting point you make about COP26. We were fortunate enough as an organisation to be invited to have observer status. And um, I'm assuming, Emma, we probably wouldn't have been invited to do that in another country, potentially. But anyway, we we did. And it's made a, it made a huge difference. I mean, the society is a global um, you know, award of professional status for environmentalists, but it it it, it, it made a difference. So it's slightly sad that it had to happen, but we've really got to make the most of it. I mean, yeah. so that's really interesting. And and so so doing big things. It links to a question, um, Sandra Norva. Thanks for your question. What one thing do you wish big events would commit to? Well, um, <laughs> you just mentioned a big event. You, you're dealing with that, <laughs> mentioning any names, but if you had to pick the one thing that makes the biggest difference, what what might that be? Um, I've got to say ISO 2012 one and thanks Emma for struggling with the, uh, the, the, the <laughs> this talk there. So International Standard 2012 one is sustainable events, which covers the three pillars of sustainability, social, environmental and economic. Um, it's genuinely a fantastic sustainability standard. And like we said, we worked with the government, HMG and ARAP to achieve that for G7 and COP26. It's so embracing. Uh, it's such a wonderful management system to embrace everything within the events sector. Um, and we, we want more people to get on board with it. Please listen to our podcast, Sustainability Street, about that as well. Football Stadium Stale, they can go for it as well if you're interested. Um, but it's genuine. It's, it's really a fantastic uh, management system to support anyone that's running a small event, large event, music event, theatre event, stadiums, you know, on the pitch, off the pitch, every, every type of meetings, conference and industry that's out there that runs events can go for sustainability. Um, it takes time, uh, typically between six, six to 12 months to implement it, but it can be a game changer. Um, and it can be the difference between someone choosing to come to your event or not, um, someone choosing to come and speak at your event or not, um, someone being a participant in your event or not, because it addresses so many issues, Dougal, from diversity and inclusion to the, to the vegan options on the menu, through to the transport options, how to get to that venue. So that would be my one, my one plea is if there's any event managers on here. Uh, and thanks, Sandra, for the question. So look at <laughs> ISA. My, my hand's just coming up to so sustainability <coughs> street. Was that did you say that was a what was sustainability street that you said you urged people uh, to go my my that? podcast, which uh, is just only a year old called Sustainability Street. Please check it out. Yeah. All right. That'd be very thank kind you. of everybody. And thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. Not, not, not <laughs> at all. I mean, um, thank. Uh, Phil's come on and we'll be wrapping things up soon. So off. Massive. No, that's me, not you. Massive congratulations again. Um, well oh, done. Well it's done. epic. And well thanks done. to Phil for nudging me because he kept sending me emails saying, I think you should apply for this. So I really appreciate that, Phil. Um, and, and, and I really do want to congratulate the other finalists. You know, I mean, gosh, when you were reading out Stephanie and Russell's portfolio there i was like my god yeah you know, i'm just, just going to walk away now and no, no, the cool. computer off <laughs> so just to just just to clarify something we we all nudge quite a lot of people and phil's not on the judging panel just <laughs> in case uh, that was not clear um thanks phil that's all right becky it's okay you see, you've got the award now we can't take it away it doesn't matter what you say um but look the 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 connections there between you and what dale's trying to build just over the river here in my hometown i'm sure you're aware of that development if you're not i mean I think even if Dale likes, we should just all go and camp on his boat till he talks to us about that. Road one. trip. Yeah. Road trip. Feels like a road trip. I just want to thank before I 
a sign off. Thanks, everybody. But I want to um, hope, wish Will well. And thanks, Emma, for so ably and Phil in particular standing in to do some different bits. We had a bit of a jig around. So thanks, every everybody, and particularly Emma, who's um, did so brilliantly there. And um, Phil, over you to wrap up proceedings. Thank you very much, Deagle. Um, right. So, well, if we can get Becky and uh, Dale working together, and if we need any storage solutions, we get all <laughs> involved as well. That'd be fantastic. We're <laughs> talking about collaboration. Um, but thank you very much. A huge thank you to Dougal and to Emma um, for your very key parts in today's proceedings, and to Dale and to Ian as well for, um, for some absolutely uh, vital bits of um, insight, I think, for, for us all to learn from. Um, all that's left for me to say is a huge congratulations to our 2022 Environmental Professional of the Year and Registrant Newcomer of the Year. Huge congratulations. Um, your trophies and your certificates will be with you very, very shortly. Um, now to focus, uh, we, we talked about World Environment Day today. Happy uh, World Oceans Day. Something else for us to look into and there's loads of uh, interesting insights at worldoceanday.org. So just a little plug for them, um, just to have a look at what you could be doing in terms of saving our our oceans uh, and that's very much linked to what uh, Ian was talking about earlier as well. Um, please do keep an eye, on, an eye out on upcoming activities, opportunities and news from the Society for the Environment. Uh, take a look at our new website um, and sign up to receive semi-regular emails and e-newsletters uh, from us as well just to stay up to date and if you're interested in becoming a registered environmental professional then uh, that is the website to go to and you'll be able to find everything you need there. Um, so hopefully there's a few more uh, budding chartered environmentalists, RFPs and RFTechs on the call. Uh, thank you very much for watching and taking part and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>